let's pray. I love this study. It's been a blessing to me, and I hope it will be to you too. So let's pray and ask the only one that can illuminate our hearts, our Father, the Lord Jesus. Father, we thank you for your love for us and your presence. And I want to I want to say the prayer that you taught us both, Lord, at the beginning of your ministry and at the end. And because I think it's very beautiful, and it, I, I I say it all the time, but I want to say it here and repeat, and but we're all familiar with it, but. Um, our Father who art in heaven, you know, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us of our debts as we forgive others. And Lord, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And why? Because yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right. I say that because again, it's a prayer that I, I probably say daily. I and and and, and God and the Holy Spirit just opens my heart to illuminate parts and, and stay on those parts for a while. Like give us this day our daily bread, um, which is what we're doing today. God's feeding us his word, which is his his bread, the bread of life. He says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And oh, he has such a rich feast. Every time we get back into it, don't we? Every time you study his word, you're just blessed. And you're and, and because that is something that's that relationship we have through the Holy Spirit with God, our Father. Uh, and, uh, and it's beautiful. We're stepping into a section here in Luke chapter 18, where Jesus addresses prayer. <clears throat> he uses us several things through this. The, the author of Luke, Luke, the doctor, inspired by the Holy Spirit to teach us about prayer, uh, among other things. And, and it's so beautifully, beautifully rich. The context, to give you a little background, if you step back into chapter 17, toward the end, Jesus is talking on end times. In fact, the discussion was kind of set off by the Pharisees in verse 20, when they asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come. And he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. The Pharisees were looking for this kingdom to come take over the Romans to set up. You know, it doesn't come with observation, nor will they say, see here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. And Jesus was giving the Pharisees who were looking you know, a certain direction. He said, you need to step back here. No, that's going to happen until the kingdom of God comes in your hearts and you become a part of it that you'll get to witness the, the, the kingdom coming. Otherwise, you'll be under judgment. We know that. You're, you're eternally damned. You're, you're separated from God by the wrath, by our sin, because God has wrathful against sin. The wrath of the Lamb is upon us, apart from that. And so he gave them that. But then he went on with his disciples privately to, to tell some more details about the end times. And you can read that at the end of chapter 17. So the context is end time events the rapture, the tribulation, he gives you, he hits on some of these things. And then he, he uh, with the disciples there toward the end of that discussion, um, he, he uh, when he he comes to uh, verse 37, and they said to him, where Lord, so he said to them, wherever the body is, the eagles will be gathered, wherever Jesus is, where the church is coming, the body of Christ coming back with the church, hey, that's where all everything else is going to, we're going to be gathered together, that's coming. And I want you to know that. But in the meantime, Verse eight, chapter 18, verse 1, look what he says here. Then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart, not faint, not grow weary. Jesus says, men should always pray. In light of the end times, which you and I are in, in these last days, he says, don't stop praying or you will lose heart. Don't lose heart. Stop praying. And now he's going to illustrate that with some stories, some uh, some some uh, illustrations and parables. Back in the uh, World War II, when London was bombing in the campaign from the Nazi uh, Empire against Britain, there was a phrase that came out of that. Nearly every night, Britain was bombed, and they would be heading to shelters. You know the story. They would send the kids out into the countryside. There was, it was a time of terror and, and, and great fear and whether you'd make it through the night. And this phrase came out of that time, which really uh, points to, it probably came from this, this verse or verses like this. That phrase was, if your knees are knocking, kneel on them. 
right? If your knees are knocking, if you're quaking because those planes are flying over, the, kneel, start praying. Uh, and in prayer, we are strengthened. We are, we are encouraged. We are emboldened. It's, uh, it's amazing what the Spirit does. So he's telling us we ought to be in prayer here in verse 1. So don't despair. Be in Prayer. Yes, it rhymes. I thought you could, Pearl got it. He's like, if don't despair, be in prayer, right? So verse two, he goes on to give. Now we're talking about prayer. He's going to give an example, a parable. He says, there was in a certain city, a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Okay, as a judge, an ungodly judge, doesn't, he's not afraid of God. There's no fear of the Lord in him. Uh, he doesn't fear what man say. He's just this probably prideful, cocky, you know, judge. Now, there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, get justice for me from my adversary. Get justice for me, she would cry to him. And he would not for a while. But afterward, he said within himself, though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest her continual complaint, compl um, coming she wearies me now look what the lord says then the lord said hear what the unjust judge said and in verse seven and shall not god and i'm sorry and shall god not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him though he bears along with them i tell you that he will avenge them speedily nevertheless when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Now, this verse, I, it did in my heart for, for many years. Uh, I, I took it as, okay, this is, this is a verse that we need to be, just be continually on God. we got to keep asking him over and over and over. Don't stop asking him. In fact, you need to ask him to the point he's just weary of you <laughs> of coming to him. And he's like, okay, I'm going to do what you want. All right. You, you've asked, you, you learned your lesson, right? But we find in the parables that Jesus gives, there's both contrasts and there's comparisons. Now, this is a contrast parable. So that is not the point of this message, of this parable. And remember, we're talking about prayer. This is a contrast. And I like to illustrate that for you here because it's so beautiful and it's encouraging and it's exciting. We see here we have a widow in this, and we have an unjust judge, right? That's, that's the <clears throat> comparison. Then we've got a comparison to who? Our father, our God, and us, his children, the bride, okay? So one, you have a widow who has very li little legal standing in her day. She didn't have a husband. She, in that culture, they could ignore her. That She had no real way of getting um, help. Uh, because it was all through the men in that culture. And when you were a widow, you just didn't have that. And so the judge could easily, I'm not going to do anything with this widow. That's just not our way. Uh, but she kept coming, okay? She kept coming. And, and because even though he was an unjust judge, he did give it to her. So the contrast here is being painted for us. Okay, how much more our God, our Father, our Abba, who loves us, when we come to him, is he going to respond? And, and here's what, so she didn't have legal standing. She was a widow. Who are we? We're the bride of Christ. We have a husband. All right, that's, that's one comparison. She was alone. We're not alone. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the down pain. We have God in us, right? She was poor. We are rich. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 tells us that, uh, that we might have the riches of God in him. I love that. I'm going to turn to it. 2 Corinthians 8, chapter 9. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9. Um, says here, beginning in verse 8, says, I speak not by commandment, but by I am attesting to the sincerity of your love by the diligence of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that, through, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. So we are rich. She was poor. We have the richness of, the, of God inside, Jesus Christ. We have all the promises of God are at are ours okay we are rich so there's a comparison here um she had uh no lawyer who's our lawyer mm -hmm. jesus christ the righteous the advocate in heaven we had the greatest lawyer possible 
uh, 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 on our behalf, right? Uh, it's been said that a good lawyer knows the law, and he does. A good lawyer does know the law. I should tell Cindy that about her, you know, her her lawyers. A good no a good lawyer knows the law. A great lawyer knows the judge. Mm -hmm. Right, <laughs> that's right. And does Jesus know the Father, the Judge? He he's you know into it. He knows the Judge. Our our lawyer is awesome, and he knows the Judge. So, um, sec fifthly, the Judge in this story was a grumpy Judge uh, who did not fear God. Contrasted, as I said, to our Judge, a loving Father, our Abba. Uh, he knows you know if there's on the Supreme Court, if the Supreme Court Judge has children, they have immediate access to come anytime into the chambers of that judge, right? You can just walk right in, and Jesus says, we can come boldly before the throne of grace because of the blood of Jesus Christ. The contrast is starkly wonderful. God's saying, he's using this thing, you know, in prayer. You, you got those that, that pray, and they, they, you, they say these many words. The Pharisees say all these words. He's like, I, I'm your father. Just come and ask. I will, and he's going to answer that for us here in a moment, too. Six, that was a court of law. We're in the court of grace, right? We come before the throne of grace, I should say, which is unearned, unmerited uh, favor with God. Uh, a nice way to remember that, I think I said it before, is grace, G-R-A-C-E, is God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. And we have that. So this parable connects to about prayer, the next one that goes on. So we have that contrast here of how we ought to pray and not lose heart. Isaiah 40, I would like to refer you to that too. Isaiah 40, verse 31. Uh, and if I may, I'll turn there. Isaiah 40, verse 31 to reemphasize this in, in the Old Testament. Uh, God's word to us. Isaiah 40, 31. Beginning in verse um, 28, it says, have you not known, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall not shall even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings of like eagles, and they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So God's telling us here at the beginning of this parable. He says, He says, we are always pray and not to faint. So we go to the one who never faints, and his strength is what encourages us when i i go through the we all do right those times where we're just oh, i was talking earlier all this stuff that i have on my agenda the things to do and uh, all these camps coming up and the things to prepare and to prepare bible classes and 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 and, and, I, and I think in my own flesh i'm like oh god how am, how am i gonna do this and i begin to kind of oh you know oh. and then i pray <laughs> and then you're like oh wait a minute it's not about me. Yeah, that's right. You got this. You're going to provide. You're going to do it. And, and it's encouraging. So God's, that, that's the only way I'm encouraged is, is through prayer and, and again, spending time again with him. Verse 9, we see a continuing word here in verse 9. It says also. So the same theme is continuing about prayer and, and, and not fainting. And look what he says here. And he, and he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus within himself. He prayed within himself. He prayed to himself. Oh, he addresses God here, but he's not praying to God. He's addressing himself. He's praying to hear his own voice, his own, his own goodness. He's, he's a, he's a, trying to make himself um, glorified here. It's, it's, oh, it's, it's all this religiosity, this self-righteousness that I am better than those. And it, it just oozes out of his words as, as the Lord uh, describes this situation. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus within himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or, or even this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. So you see that that is pouring off. And, and this is a, well, this is a heart 
if we're going to see just in, in this illustration and many others that will keep you from salvation. This, this is a heart. And, and again, I, I'm going to say this. I Hopefully I'll say this again and again. This is not a heart that you can overcome yourself. You can't change this. If I were, were to, if this were a message where, if I were to give you 10 points on how that you can not pray like this and you need, and here's how you should pray. That would be a terrible sermon because you, the points are never going to help you accomplish this. This is the work of the Holy Spirit we're about to see demonstrated in the tax collector. It is his work. God gives us these pictures, these, these, these parables to help you and I realize, is the Holy Spirit working in me or isn't he? Okay? Because eternity is way too long to make a mistake on this, right? Eternal hell or eternity with the Father. And it's the work of the Holy Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit is always convicting the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. That is, that is his, his, what he's doing. He's convicting people of sin. And if we harden ourselves to that Holy Spirit, which is called blasphemy of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, that separates us. It seals us off from accepting Christ as our Savior, from receiving the free gift that He wants to give us. Right? Uh, look what it says here. Go, continuing on after this long, laborious prayer, which meant nothing to God because it was really it was to Himself. Verse 13, we see the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Brevity, simple, short to the point, heartfelt. This is a man who not only knows he's a sinner, but he is pleading for mercy. He knows he knows his position. It's, I got to have mercy. There's nothing I can do. I need you, God. Think of the parable of the prodigal son. Another beautiful one, right? When he came to himself, he was, he was hard-hearted to his father. I want what I want. I'm so, give me mine. He goes out and spends it on the world and himself and just throws it away and in sinful living. And then when he comes to the body, comes to himself, he's like, even my servant, my father's servants have more than I do. I will go back and confess and, and, and maybe he'll make me a servant. Humility. There, there's a picture of humility here too that Jesus is going to point out if I do this morning, that humility, uh, repentance is absolutely necessary. But again, this isn't something if you're sitting here, okay, how can I be repentant? How can I do that? Mm -mm. It's, there's no bullet there's no list of rules and things to follow for you and i to accomplish this but one there's one 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 thing that god requires that we believe that we focus on jesus that we look to the author and finisher of our faith and we, we ask him god we, we we go toward the light we seek him and we only seek him because the holy spirit is drawing us we wouldn't otherwise again that's why we can't even boast that we would seek God, that we would go after him. We were like, he's the one that draws us. He does it all. But because we're made in his image and he's given us free will, we can reject it. And that's why these are so sobering. They're reminding us to look in our hearts. Is the Holy Spirit working? And not just for initial salvation, but sanctification. That's the evidence that the Holy Spirit is in us, that we continually are being prompted by the Spirit to be, be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. What we read in scriptures, the way Jesus is, is the way we are becoming. Become you perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. It's a, it's a process, but it's done by the Holy Spirit by our continually recognizing our sin and repenting and, and saying, God be all the glory. You know, think of your own relationship. I want to pause here in that moment and ask you this. Think of your own relationship with Jesus. I thought of this again last night. What, my relationship with Jesus. When was the last time you wept over your own sin? Can you, do you have a moment? You're like, yeah, that was just last week or that was a month ago. Or, yeah, last year, or whatever it is. When did you weep, felt burdened by your own sin? Because we sin every day. This, this isn't, it's not, God says, if you say you have no sin, you are a, a liar, right? We all have sin. So 
when was the last time we were burdened over it? Because sin is a rebellion against God at its very core. It's, it's saying, God, who loves me, who gave everything for me, I don't want to do what you want. I want to do my own way. And we do it all the time. But my question is, when was the last time you were burdened over it? When did you last pour out your heart before the Lord, thanking him for his mercy and grace upon your life? If you are in God's word, which is sharper than any two-edged sword, and I, I trust that each of us are, then this is something that it's, it just will happen because the spirit, the, the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword dividing between the spirit and the soul. It shows you what in ourselves, what's right and wrong. Like Paul says in Romans, when you look at the Romans in chapter seven, and he says, I don't want to do this, but I do it. And I, the things I want to do, I don't do. Uh, th there's this battle going on. And at the end, he says, thanks be to Jesus Christ. He's the one, right? The focus comes always back to him. And that's how you know the conviction of the Holy Spirit, because you're drawn to Jesus. But seriously, if you've not wept over your sin in a long time, my, my encouragement to you is you look, I, I said, seek the Lord Jesus, read your word, you will, he will bring you to these points of just like you're looking into the edge of hell. You're like, that is where I was going, that pit. That was me. That's where I'm destined because of my sin. This sin I see coming out of my flesh that dwells still in this body that has not been renewed. Th that would have taken me right down there. But except for your grace and your mercy and immediately, it's like the Lord brings you to a trembling, a fear, an awe of, oh, and then he relieves it with grace. And you're like, oh, God, thank you. See, this is the work of the Holy Spirit. It's not something we can work up, but what God does call us to do is seek him. And that's why you should hear preachers all the time to so point to Jesus, not give you bullet points of this is what you need to do. This is what you need to do. Those are just, that's not it. Jesus Christ is the answer. And that's where we got to focus. It's his shed blood. It's his victory on the cross that overcame everything, leading us to fall down in grateful thanks and admiration. It's the gift of the Holy Spirit who shed uh, who, whose love has been shed abroad in our hearts, right? And it's all done by God. And that's why John the Baptist, when the Pharisees came to him and he was baptizing, he said, bring who, who, who told you to flee from the wrath to come? Do you know that's what you and I are doing? We're fleeing from the wrath to come. We have fled and our refuge is who? It's Jesus Christ. We fled into the arms of Jesus and Jesus is. And so he said, who told you to flee from the, the wrath to come? He says, bring forth fruit. Rep I'm sorry, bring forth a uh, fruit worthy of repentance. Yes, that's what he said. Bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. Your heart's being broken, burdened by your sin. And that takes, that's only by trusting in the God's word and looking to Jesus. He's the one that does the work. And, and when you see it, you're excited and you're, you're, you want to share this with others and help them see the truth that it's Jesus, 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 Jesus. It's only Jesus. Keep pointing them to Jesus. Even after they're, they're justified in Jesus, where do we go from there? We keep walking what the path. Well, who is the path? Jesus. He is, the, is, he a, is he a wide broad way? No, he's narrow. He's a narrow path. There's a lot of ways that shoot off of it. There's even wide paths that the world is falling. Eh, there's a lot of ways to heaven. Let's go this way. Legalism, moralism. I'll be a moral person. I'll be civil. I'll, 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 I'll do all the right things. None of those paths lead to our Father in heaven. It's only Jesus. And, and that begins on the day of justification and salvation and sanctification, all the way to when we're glorification, right? That when we get our new bodies, no more of this sin and battle going on in this, just perfect love, perfect uh, allegiance to our Lord forever. And that, that's coming. So there's this picture here that we, we of course, see there in that, that parable of the Pharisee, the, the two different attitudes. And now he's going to express it even more. He takes it further. This is so beautiful. Oh, um, let's see. He went down. The other one justified. He hung himself to the exalted. I didn't finish it, did I? Uh, so verse 14, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. There's that word justified. He saved salvation, justification. How was he justified? We're getting a picture here of it, of a part of it, and we can put it together with the other pieces in scripture. It's repentance, it's belief, which is tied to repent. It's humility. It's coming to God humbly. It's not like, okay, I'll take you, Lord. 
Yeah, save me. Uh, the Lord is my Savior. You, there, there, no, no, no. There is a definite recognition of sin because we're all sinners and it's the Holy Spirit that convicts us and opens our hearts and minds to see this truth. And, and you put these things together and you can see a clear picture of, of what, what is required of us. It's just to go toward Jesus, go toward the gate, the light, the, the, the ever, that's through the gate and, and he does the work and he gets all the glory. Uh, but these things show up in us because of the fruit of the Holy Spirit in us uh, is, is what's happening. All right. Now, again, this is all tying together as we move into the next section. <clears throat> We're getting ready um, probably on Mother's Day to do, and I, I think we did that here too, and they may be, uh, to do the blessing of the children. Uh, the children come and, and pray over them and then encourage the, the parents with scripture and to raising their child in the word. And then the church, the church is also part of the body that's going to support these young children and these families to pray for them. And, 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 and Jesus had children come to him. Look what happened here. He says, they also brought uh, to him infants to him that he might touch them. But when he, when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them, but Jesus called them to him and said, Oh, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them for of such is the kingdom of God. Verse 17, assuredly, I say to you, Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. Another aspect, another example of the Holy Spirit in us. What happens when he, he is doing a work in us? We will receive Jesus, the kingdom of God, into us as a little child. Now, this isn't defined here. What does that mean? Does that mean? Uh, but in the context, when you look back to the Pharisee and the publican, uh, when you look at the widow and the, the whole thing here on prayer and, and, and what's going on here, the context suggests uh, strongly that this, as a child, we are totally dependent and needy, right? We're, we're not self-sufficient. We're not uh, able to clothe ourselves and feed ourselves and take care of ourselves. A little child needs to be taken care of, and they have that attitude. I need my parents. I need, if, if they're separated from a parent for a while, it's like, where's my daddy? Where, you know, like when I was little mom, when you lost me, remember you, when she lost me at the fair, you know, and I'm, she was probably, I, I probably was oblivious. I thought like, well, until somebody found, but we want back with our, our daddy and our mommy. And, and, and he says, you're not going to enter the kingdom of God unless you have this, there's this desire for me. You see, again, that comes from the Holy Spirit. That's something we look and say, do I have a desire to be with Jesus? Do I desire to be dependent on him? And at the same time, I chuckle because in our flesh, it's totally opposite of that. And I have these times when I, I try to work on stuff. I try to, whether it's making something for a chicken coop or working on the car or, or just putting together some kind of a project. And, and and there's something in me that says, I ought to be able to do this. And when I don't do it, I'm kind of like, I almost, I'll say the words I've said them before. I say, God, do I have to ask you to help me with everything? <laughs> and then I catch myself going, well, yes, yes, you do. You know, he's, God says, you can do nothing apart from me. It, and it's this whole thing in his spirit. He's like, I want you to be dependent on me like a child. Also the humility, like we saw before of the publican, humility, dependence, this is the attitude of the Holy Spirit in us, uh, drawing, and, and, and if that's not there, then again, I say, do what you can, that's seek the Lord, He's, and if you have no desire to seek the Lord, then you, you should obviously be aware He is not inside of you, you don't have Him, you're under the wrath of God still, you're His enemy, because as enemies, we don't want God, we don't want anything to do with God, we are we're all gone astray. We're like sheep gone astray, as, as Isaiah tells us. This is probably the greatest example of what sin is. We're, we've all done our own thing, our own way. But when, it com when the Spirit's there, it conflicts with our flesh. And, and that's the beauty. And you're going, yes, God, you're present. He's, he's doing what he can do. So our flesh rebels. Now we get another illustration. Jesus just wants to make this very clear through the book of Luke. And I love this illustration. It's really powerful. Beginning in verse 18, it says, Now a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Again, okay, in, in the book of Mark, Mark chapter 10, this story is told again there. And in that story, you get a little more information. This ruler, this young ruler, actually ran to Jesus. He came running up to Jesus and he knelt before Jesus. This young man comes up, 
running to Jesus, kneeling before Jesus and, and saying, you know, maybe hearing some of what's going on with about this the children, you got to have the heart of a child enter the kingdom. He's uh, going through, you know, well, you know, okay, what do I got to do? And here he comes with eagerness to, to, to the Lord Jesus. Um, and sadly, as you, you all are aware of the story, this is probably the only one time in scripture that I know of where someone ran to the Lord, they fell at his feet of the Lord and left worse off than when they came. And again, you're going to see why. And again, it's the Holy Spirit's look as he, as he speaks to our hearts. Is this me? Is it, is this, do I have an idol in front of God? Do I have something that I worship that I'm unwilling to surrender, whatever that might be. And if the spirit's there, he's leading us to just smash this idol, whatever it is. In this case, it's riches. We'll see that here in a moment. He says, okay, so he comes running up. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good, but God. No, I say no one, but no one is good, but one. That is God. Verse 19. No one is good, but God. All right. This is almost like um, Jesus is, is saying, you know, kind of st stepping back and trying to find, why are you calling me good? Because in the Old Testament, Ecclesiastes, is, is, it's in Ecclesiastes, and of course, Romans 3.10, Ecclesiastes 7.20, it, it tells us that none is righteous but God. And this is a teaching this young man would have known. And he runs, runs up and calls this man God, a good. It, it, Jesus say, are you calling me good because you, you know something? You, you're aware that I am who I am? Uh, you know, kind of that, and I don't know if that caught, if he paused there and that caught the man off guard, kind of like, or, or he, he's doing it like we do every day, say, oh, that's a good Christian, or he's a good man, or that's a good woman, right? We do that all the time. And God's like, I told you there's none good but me. And that's the truth. In fact, the Spurgeon said, the longer we're with God, the longer we're, in fact, a, a maturing Christian will say something like, um, I, I am, I am not worthy. I'm not worthy. You know, we, as we mature, we know we're not worthy. And then a mature Christian, as they grow, they say, I am, I'm terrible. I'm the worst. And you know, we see that in the example of Paul's life. We talked about that last time as Paul matured, he went and said all those three different statements ending up with, I'm the chief of all sinners. I'm just, because we know the Lord more. We see his perfection and in, in contrast us which makes us praise him all the more. So you, you've got this, this, this little thing that goes on with Jesus. He asks him, you know, good teacher. He says, there's none good, but God, why are, you, why are you calling that to me? But then he goes on, he says, answering the man's, trying to answer the man's question because he knows the man's heart because he's God. And look what he does. He says, you know, the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. And verse 21, and, and he said, all these things I have done and I've kept from my youth. And you may have said, all these things I've done, I've kept from my youth, all right? And, and in the book of Mark, it adds uh, something different here because it goes on here. But in the book of Mark, it says Jesus looked at him or beheld him and loved him. Jesus loved this young man. It, it, it's an allusion to that, you know, he, he knew this man was morally good on the outside. He, he was following the law. He truly had this desire but there was something in the way that only Jesus could see. And he knew how he knew the process to get rid of it. And he gives him a command to do so. He says, you know, the commandment. <clears throat> he says, I've done all these things for my youth. What's the one thing commandment he did not list there. One of the commandments, which is he's about to address. <clears throat> it's that not, thou shall not covet. And coveting is wanting things, acquiring things. And, 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 um, um, beyond what 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 your needs are it's it's wanting more and more and more stuff kind of like you see those shows about hoarders right where they just they're buried alive in their house because they just, they just it's this covetousness this, this, that just controls them uh it's an idol uh so jesus said when he heard these things he said to him you still lack one thing sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me but when he heard this, he became very sorrowful, for he was very rich. This man had this one block. Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life, 
whose desire is that all of us be set free. He desires us all to be set free. And we said in the, in, in the book of John, he says, if you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And he saw what was keeping this young man in bondage, what was keeping him from eternal life. And he was given the opportunity right there, kill it, throw it away, come follow me. And it says the man went away sorrowful and we never heard from him again in scripture. Lord willing, he did turn, but it's not recorded. He went away from eternal life, from the light of the world, from Jesus Christ. And those first 24, so when Jesus saw that he had become very sorrowful, and this word can be taken two ways. It either means he was very sorrowful or that Jesus was very sorrowful about the situation. Uh, it can be either way. Um, and I, I tend to think it's both. How hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. Why is that? How hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God because they become a substitute for God. They, they crush um, humility, neediness, a child needs, right? A child de desires to be taken care of to, um, because you, you have everything you think you need. You've, you're fed every day. And of course, we live in that, that country. And you can see that's the result that, that we've turned away from God because we have everything we need, we think, but we're blind and, 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 and naked, not knowing truly what we are. Um, but that, that's the case here. He says it's, ah, it's so hard um, for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Then in verse 25, it says, for it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Now, there's been different thoughts about this, and I'm sure you all have heard various things on it. One is that it's literally like if you have a needle and you try to stuff a camel through it, that's how impossible it is. You, you can't do it. So with man, you can't do it. That's one interpretation. Another is that there were these huge gates in Jerusalem, in, the, in that area in, the, in times past, that had a smaller gate within the gate, uh, that, that at night the big gates were closed, and then the smaller gate would, would only allow a man to pass through it. But there was, the, there was the, 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 the thought that a camel could go through it if you took all of its pack, all of its, off, all of its burdens off its back, removed everything, and it would get on its knees. Then it could just get through. I like that picture. You know, whether that's exactly true or not, but it's a beautiful picture. It's what he's, saying here. he's telling that man, drop your burdens. Your burdens are your riches. That's what you're clinging to for life. That's, he says, get rid of it. Give it to the poor. Come follow me and you'll have treasures in heaven. Uh, get on your knees. Humble yourself as a child, as, as this penitent tax collector. Get on your knees and, and, and know that I will supply all your needs. Don't depend on what you see, but on on. on on the Lord Jesus. Um, so um, you again have that, that picture, um, but he went away sorrowful. Now look at this. It says in verse uh, 26, and those who heard it, and those who heard it said, who then can be saved? And why the disciples do this? Because in the culture of that day, those who were rich, it was taught that that shows that they were spiritually right with God. God was blessing them because they had wealth and the Pharisees were wealthy. And so their mindset was like, oh, you, you, you know, if you don't, if you have riches, that's an example that you've done the right things, all the good things. You've, you followed the law. You're, you're being blessed by God. And that's a trap. It's being used today. There's so many that are teaching the health and wealth gospel. You, you, you know, if you're, if you're following God, then you're going to be driving a good car. You're going to be living in a big house. You, that has nothing to do with the, those blessings. Um, God, in fact, tells us that many uh, of us that are followers of Christ will suffer persecution. We will be, uh, go through hardships and uh, pains and sufferings, and, and, and we do. We, you, we are, there's all those, those sufferings and things that we go through, but in it all, we still bless the Lord, his name, and give him praise, regardless of what happens, what riches or not riches. Not that riches are bad. Jesus is not saying that. But he's saying the love of riches, the, the, that you make that your idol, that is bad. And if any one of us has that in our life, that that is our stumbling block, then yes, God's saying, get rid of it. <laughs> if that's an idol, if that, in fact, he even takes it further, say, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off, you know, uh, not that he, we're supposed to cut off our hand, but he's telling you to take it seriously. Eternity is way too long to make, to, to, to be deceived and go the wrong way. But he said, these things are 
Now, I love this. I love this. Verse 27. But he said, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. And that's the gospel. That's the point. The, the, the disciples are going, still thinking about law, rituals, keep it, good, blessings. And God says, none of that gets you into heaven. But with God, it's possible. And it's his righteousness, as we know. And Peter said, we have left all to follow you. And he said to them, surely I say to you, there is not one who has left house or parents or brothers or wife or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who shall not receive many times more in this present time and in the age to come in eternal life. Beautiful truth. Verse 31, we'll wrap it up here. Then he took the 12 aside and said to them, behold, you got to keep in mind, he's just, they just heard all these things that works. The Pharisees earlier raised the question, when is the kingdom coming? Uh, the mindset, of course, of the Pharisees is that he's going to overthrow the Roman government. And there's all these, these preconceived false ideas that they're, they're putting the, the horse before the cart kind of thing, or the cart before the horse, as, as scripture shows, um, because Jesus is coming back to reign and rule. But before that happens, this is what's going to happen. And so he's giving him that truth again right here. But I want to end with this one thing. It's so beautiful for you and me in our, our, when we read scripture. I love this. But verse 31, he says, he took the 12 aside and said to them, behold, we're going to Jerusalem and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the son of man will be accomplished. Guys, all of it's going to be accomplished. The suffering servant, the, 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 the uh, you know, the, the, the serpent striking the heel of the, of the, the seed of the child that would come, the, the Messiah, right? And he said, for he will be delivered to the Gentiles and will be mocked and insulted and spit upon, and they will scourge him and kill him. And the third day he will rise again. Now look at verse 34. But they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them, and they did not know the things which were spoken. It reminds me of when Jesus was with Peter washing his feet and jesus told peter he says what i'm doing you don't understand right now but afterwards you will okay it's the way it is with god's word god tells you and i be in his word read his word you're going to read it many times and go i don't get that i do this all the time i don't understand this part lord that's okay god says wait the Holy Spirit will illuminate you to understand it when the time is right. But don't neglect putting it in your heart. I've heard so many give the excuse, I read that, I don't understand it. So they don't read it. Oh, no, 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 no. God says, put the word in your heart, keep it there. God will give you understanding. And when that happens, it is such a joy. You and I experience it when you're, when you're awakened. And it's something you'll read. And you may have done this too. You've read it many, 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 many times. And all of a sudden, your eyes are open and you see it and you go, oh, so stupid. Why didn't I see that before, right? You're like, but that's the Holy Spirit. That's God working in you. And it should remind you as a joy, that's that relationship you have. And God will let us know when we need to know it, but keep putting his word in there. I'm going to read my Bible and pray. A great way to start the day. So keep that in your hearts and... Uh, and enjoy that. Let's pray and we'll break. Father, thank you for your love again. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for your, your blessing us with your word and our thank you for our time and fellowship here together. I pray you'll continue to help us to just encourage one another and, and grow together in you. And uh, we, we'll, we're on a journey, Father. We know that we're following you and we thank you for your grace and mercy when we stumble and fall and you keep bringing us back on the path. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, I mean, I mean, no, I'm the mental one. All right, mom, I love you. I'll see you. Love you too. Have a wonderful day, honey. I do something about those lips, okay? I don't know what it is with these. <laughs> it looks like you have this dark tan with these. I think you've got a filter on because your lips are jumping all over the place. What is going on? What can I say? Look, look, look at that. Let's see that. Oh, it looks good to me. Get in the shadows again, Mom. I, now I see it. Now I see it. <laughs> I have any lipstick on, but it looks like I got it smeared all around my face. Oh, yeah, I see it now. <laughs> I didn't do good. Or does it? Let's see. <laughs> it's just me. <laughs> Did you see that? No.
That's weird. The lighting is not the best here, that's for sure. Oh, I see what you mean. <laughs> see if yours look that way. Um, Come on, I do, and you don't. That's really weird.